a lot of people still trickling in. I hope you're all excited for what's coming up next. Because coming up next is Henrique Lode, who is a South African-based game designer turned game lecturer turned game designer again, who is working at the South African Nyamakop company, who have released in 2017 or 18 the game Semblance, which we have already also uh, exhibited here at the Maze Festival. And she is going to be talking about a project that she did over the last year. So in 2012, uh, 2021, she got together with some friends to do 12 games in 12 months to improve their skills, to learn more about game design. And she's going to walk us through her challenges and her discoveries as she had made one game every month for one year. So please welcome, with a big applause, Henrike Lode. Support is at the ready. This one is on. Oh, we right. can hear me. Give it up, give it up for the people in the awesome. back, the tech support guys. Thank you so much. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. And it would be great if we could see my slides as well. But meanwhile, I'm going to start talking a little bit. There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, as you just heard, my name is Henrique Lode, but I also go by Riker, as my friends know me as. Uh, you can get more information about me on my website. And uh, I just got a lovely introduction, so I think that suffices. If you want to know anything more, you can come hit me up after the talk or look at the website to look some stuff um, of what I've other stuff I've been doing. And yeah, today I want to talk about my creative practice as a game designer, and more specifically 12 and 12, a challenge I did in 2021 to make 12 games in 12 months. And I'm going to take you through my journey. So over the last decade, I've been mainly working as a game designer and as a university lecturer. And I haven't really been programming anything since my computer science degree in 2008. That's 14 years ago, so you do the math. I'm not as young as I look. <laughs> and then in 2020, uh, I started making some twi tiny twine games, um, and I got really fascinated, fascinated with what you could do with Sugarcube and CSS and JavaScript. And um, yeah, I want to give a bit of a shout out to my boyfriend, Sugar, who's sitting in the front row. He's also a developer, and uh, he uh, encouraged me to take this a little bit further. And he said, you know, we should do a challenge. We should try to really get better at making games and take this to the next level. Um, and if you know anything about me, it's, you know, I can't say no to a good challenge like this. And just to be clear, in 2021, I was a full-time lecturer, um, and I uh, I was kind of in a probation period, so I also had to register for a PhD, and clearly that was not challenging enough. So let's also make 12 games. Um, and yeah, we wanted to make sure that we didn't just aimlessly noodle around. We had to use our time very strategically. 
And so we wanted to restrict ourselves to exactly one month, and we wanted to hold each other accountable by presenting our progress to each other regularly. And yeah, we wanted to become more intentional about the game design process, the game development pro process. Uh, we wanted to learn how to execute really quickly and improve our skills massively. Let go of perfectionism, because that's what you have to do when you have time constraints and ship on schedule. And then we kind of ended up writing a little manifesto. 12 and 12 is a challenge to make 12 prototypes in 12 months, to create a habit of deliberate practice and experimentation, to develop our creative and technical skills through rapid prototyping, and to grow as game makers. And more concretely, oh, we uh, developed a couple of crucial steps to the process, which I will share with you at the end of the talk to make this all come together. So this may sound a little bit philosophical to you, so I, of course, want to show you the exact games that I made. But I have a little bit of a disclaimer, because some of you may come in wanting to do 12 games in 12 months, and you need to know that I have a lot of experience, especially game jams, um, in all kinds of areas of game development, and I am insanely ambitious. So this is not a scale to measure yourself by. If you look at this and you're like, I'm never going to be able to make such beautiful things. You're not as insane as me, and that's OK. You know, you should only compare yourself to yourself, and you can still improve massively doing 12 and 12. So don't let my weirdness discourage you. So let's get started with the first game. In January, I wanted to port a little Tamagotchi game, which I made in Twine in 2020, and port it to Unity. And this was going to be the very first game I ever made in Unity, completely by myself, with a lot of help from my boyfriend. So I took a bunch of images that I made from Twine. These were all three-frame animations, imported them into Unity, and then I hooked them up to the animator and added buttons that I could trigger the different animations. And then I added a couple of progress bars, as you need to measure the stats for hunger and happiness and a state machine. So make kind of sense of them to handle all of the different stats. And then I added speech bubbles um, as additional feedback for the player to you know, make sure that they feel good about how they're treating the puppy and to make the puppy feel more alive. And my favorite part of this was adding a poop mechanic, because that's how I learned how to instantiate prefabs at runtime, which you know, um, is a, makes you feel pretty smart when you figure that out. <laughs> um, and then I was only halfway through the month, so I let my too much gene kick in, and uh, I decided to model a, the puppy in 3D with clay cells. That is like pixels, but with clay, clay cells. Pretty cool tool. Not the most performant, or it wasn't a year ago. I don't know, maybe they got better by now. And yeah, the final product, I added some touches on lighting, user interface, sound effects, and I even added a save functionality so that you could move back between the 2D and the 3D scene. And yeah, uh, this as a final product, it's the most ambitious uh, and most polished of all of my prototypes. And the lesson I learned here is that when you're learning new tech, um, I, th I think it's really important not to have to think about design at the same time. So you can just take something that's already kind of designed, and in the end, you'll end up improving on the design anyway. In February, I decided to make a 3D model of a uterus, ovaries, and fallopian tubes, and simulate the menstrual cycle, because I wanted to learn a bit about 3D and camera stuff in Unity. And, you know, I really enjoy Clakesels. It's a cool tool. And so I wanted to push it to its complete limits. And with the help of a lot of reference images, because that's actually a really complicated thing to model in 3D, uh, I um, uh, managed to put this thing together over a couple of hours, made the uterus, ovaries, fallopian tubes. And you, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's, it doesn't really look that way. We are shown in books. It kind of looks like a hunched over dude who's carrying two giant eggs with you know, tentacle hands. It's kind of cool. Um, yeah, and then I set this whole thing up um, in 3D, where you can drag, and dr uh, drag around to manipulate the camera and then zoom in on these special angles. And then I decided to model the insides of the 
uh, of the organs, and then I had to do some cross sections so you could actually look at the insides. And uh, finally, I made the menstrual cycle where the egg is animated to move from the ovary via the fallopian tube, and it is, um, goes into the uterus and then made some particle effects to show the blood for the menstruation and mapped everything to this timeline slider that can be dragged forwards and backwards. And that's pretty much the final project, Code Red. Uh, there was a ton of stuff I wanted to add, but didn't have time for, and I learned an important lesson there because I had this big to-do list. I got a little too ambitious, as is my problem. Um, and you don't really have to, you know, be done with your to-do list for your project to be finished. You decide when it's finished, and that was the right decision which is a good lesson to learn. In March, I returned to Twine with the intention to make a hand-washing game, because it was kind of the anniversary of COVID. Um, and so I wanted to learn how to do mouse movements and integrate that with JavaScript and Sugarcube. And ah, Twine's the best. Like, this took me like two hours or something to set up some basic placeholders. Um, and make the hand follow the mouse, and then allow the player to open and close the tabs. And then I added uh, the other hand that kind of moves in correspondence to how you expect your right hand to move, and added a state machine also for dirtiness, the water temperature, the soapiness, the wetness, um, and the state machine to handle them. And then I made proper graphics for the hands. And I decided to have two poses for one hand and four poses for the other hand. And each of these needed a layer for the hand, the soap, the dirt, um, and the water on them. And then fading each layer in and out according to the stats. That is, by the way, 24 different hand graphics. Even when you think you're doing one tiny thing, it can easily get out of hand. And this is kind of what the final thing looks like. It's, um, I'm very, very happy. Clean is the name. Um, yeah, and I think my lesson for, for March is that uh, JavaScript and CSS are pure magic, but Twine is not a great thing for having a very big code base. It gets unmanageable. There's a very cool soundtrack also, um, the hip-hop sound of, ooh, it's clean. You should check it out on itch. <laughs> And in April, I decided to make a sandwich making game in Unity with a drag and drop inventory. And I wanted to understand how to navigate in 3D space and manipulate items. So for this concept, I had to learn a little bit about physics and ray tracing. And I made objects snap to points because, you know, making a sandwich is all about stacking things and snapping and stuff. And I used ProBuilder to uh, model more complex objects. But yeah, eventually the physics of it all was kind of not my friend. Um, turned out to be a lot more tricky than I thought. Just waiting for the moment where the pen falls apart. Because all of a sudden things were just disappearing. So I decided that's not exactly what I want. Um, I'm just going to, instead of snapping to points, I'm just going to parent things underneath each other to make sure they can, uh, you know, you lift the stuff and something else moves along with it. Um, and then just model a ton of stuff and just having fun making art, because that's my happy place, um, and making things pretty. And yeah, in the end, that's kind of what it looks like. You can make sandwiches. The game analyzes what kind of sandwiches you make. And the lesson was never underestimate the, the positive effects of great lighting and post-processing. It just makes it look yummy. Then we have May, where me and Sugar moved into a house. And we celebrate as game devs celebrate by making a game. <laughs> and so we decided to make a dollhouse game where players can move our furniture into our house like we just did. because. That's our idea of fun. So I drew a more or less accurate floor plan of a house, and then I brought it into Unity, and then I began again with ProBuilder modeling all the different pieces of furniture, and we used FlatKit to work a little bit with the colors, make everything look nice, and Sugar was working on the controls for moving and rotating the items, and yeah. Um, this is what the final game kind of looks like. We actually made the walls drop as well, so you can see better inside the house. 
And this was the only 12 and 12 project where I collaborated with someone else. And I love the experience, I love the game, it was really cute. But in hindsight, I kind of slipped back into old patterns, because I only worked on art, and that's what I normally do in game jams. And while it was great to learn how to use Pro Builder to make all these different items, I didn't really expand as much on my skills as I did with any of the other projects, so I think that was kind of the reason why afterwards I decided to stick to making stuff by myself. Um, and in, that's June. In June, I decided to go back to Twine, this is just going back and forth. And normally, I make weird stuff in Twine, like snake or memory or stuff like that, which don't really use text, because why would you make a text-based game in Twine? Anyone can do that. Um, so I decided to make, make myself, give myself a special challenge to make a game using only text. And I was going to be about packing my bags and moving to a new continent. Twine is, uh, Transit is my Twine masterpiece. I designed the series of mini games. I hope that's kind of visible there. Um, so there's all these changing mechanics uh, that tell the story of how I moved from Denmark to South Africa. I wanted to do the whole visa process, but it's clearly overscoped. So I decided to just make the small trip, packing my bags in my apartment in Denmark and dragging my two giant suitcases all the way to Germany. Uh, it was actually three, but I didn't want to do that to the player. Um, and then combining this constraint of using only text with magical CSS to create text-based graphics allowed me to make this unique art style and also kind of a unique form of storytelling, I think. Um, yeah, and this is the game I am the most proud of. That's actually the only one of 12 and 12, I think, that I would really be like, let's turn this into a full game, but not in Twine. It's just lots of code. It's, it gets out of hand. All right, July. I knew I wasn't going to have a lot of time in July because I was going to be really busy marking exams and stuff, so I had to make something very, very small. Uh, so I decided to make a 2D anagram game. Um, in Unity, and I wanted to learn Dootween and make some really juicy UI animations uh, and uh, interactions. So in Gramina, Anagram, Gramina, um, you must drag and drop the letters around to, to figure out, to turn one word into another one. And the color changes, so it starts in purple, and the closer you get to the right solution, it becomes purple. The very clever algorithm. <laughs> Um, and Sugar had this idea. He said, why don't you take this game and make uh, like a daily challenge and put it out on the internet? And I'm like, who's going to play that? You know, who's going to play one game <laughs> every day? And then Josh Wardle came and made Wordle and stole my idea. So I'm kidding. <laughs> but it was a great idea. I should have done it. <sighs> and then in August, I got stressed out incredibly because that's winter in South Africa. And COVID had halted my life for a really long time, like everybody else. And then we also have this thing called load shedding in South Africa, where they turn off the electricity for a couple of hours every day, sometimes multiple times per day. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a whole thing, don't ask. It's about collapsing the whole network. Um, so I decided to make a puzzle game where you have no electricity, you have to find things in the dark. And I wanted to gradually change the lighting in the rooms with different things like candles and maybe like a fire or something like that. And then as you change the lighting in the room, that changes also the text description of the room to transition from creepy to cozy and the colors and everything as the room gets brighter. And of course, the too much gene kicked in and I had to start with making a drop down inventory. Like that's obviously what you need. Um, and then I kind of only managed to make like the core mechanic, it's kind of there, but it's not really a puzzle. And I, I do really like this concept. So you can, you can pick up this uh, lighter, and then when you have the light in inventory, you can actually interact with the candles and change the lighting, and it changes the text and the description of the room. But there's only one room, and yeah. Eventually, I was also going to take this and make this a proper puzzle game, but... Um, it's the code base, again, massive, overwhelming. It's not really fun to go back to old projects when you don't know what you were doing. It's terrible. Um, and sometimes, you know, you just have to let it go. It's just what it is. So in September, I played Mutazione, which is a wonderful, amazing game. Please play it if you haven't played it. I love it so much. 
and I love the, uh, the dialogue system. And I wanted to clone it, and I wanted to learn Ink. Um, Inky is a really powerful storytelling engine that can be very easily integrated into Unity. And I wanted to use my students to use it, so I had to figure out how to use it. And, you know, just uh, very easy, no mechanics, just dialogues, just easy peasy, right? Wrong. <laughs> and it turned out really beautiful. I love this game. It's a, one of the few ones that isn't actually available on my itch page because I didn't manage writing all the dialogues. I got really stuck into trying to animate uh, the letters to really show emotions like shouting and excitement and stuff. And um, in the end, I just, I just didn't get to it. And I feel kind of stupid because we did take this road trip. We actually went for Sugar's birthday to Durban and this whole thing happened and I have all these personal experiences that I could turn into this thing. But this is really where I learned the hard way that if you put something down, you have to accept that you may never pick it up again. It might just be gone. So before you put it down, it's always better to just push through that finish line and, you know, just do all the things with it that you want to do and then just let it go. It's with Jesus. Um, in October, I wanted to direct my focus back to my research. You know, I was trying to do a PhD at the same time. I'm not doing that anymore, by the way. Um, but yeah, I wanted to make a translation tool that would allow me to translate Easy Zulu into uh, three different um, writing systems. One is Latin script, the one we generally use for everything. Uh, then the second one is Easy Bay. No, I can't do that again. Easy Bay. There's the click. Um, that's a syllable-based visual writing system specifically designed for indigenous African languages, Bantu languages. And then the third one was the International Phonetic Alphabet, which you may know of. And then the idea was kind of that I would later take all of this and turn this into language learning puzzle games and like needed a translation tool anyway. So the way this works is that you uh, write your input, that's an easy Zulu, and then underneath it, it translates it into this triangle shape, which is um, and below the third line, that's the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. And I would love to explain to you in more detail what ECB is, but it's really complicated and I don't have a lot of time. But if you're curious, uh, I'll tell you way more than you want to know if you just find me later. And then we've got November. I decided to make an isometric Metroidvania game with custom tile graphics where the player can navigate with teleportation. It's called Telepotato, because I couldn't make any more interesting character than a potato. And that's kind of how it started. Um, I had the most fun when I can experiment with a new art style, so for me, making Telepotato was super rewarding. Uh, just had to make over 60 custom tile graphics just for the water. <laughs> but it's really cool. <laughs> Um, and by now, I kind of have developed a routine, you know? I, I know how I approach a game the same way. I can set up the animations, the cameras, the sound effects, the particle effects, um, and everything kind of becomes easier and more routine over time. And it's quite tempting to add more features because just teleporting and moving around, you know, it's not necessarily that interesting, but I had learned at that point to resist that temptation. One mechanic is more than enough. Um, and then in December, I wanted to give Twine another go, you know, my last hurrah with Twine. And this time I wanted to play with sliders. I hadn't really used that UI thing before, and CSS, of course. Doesn't really have a great name because I also abandoned this one. <laughs> Uh, but the inspiration came from Florence, it's not the game, this is Florence. Uh, and I wanted to reverse engineer these, uh, the post-bike crash puzzle, uh, where you have to drag around these sliders to align images that are, you know, changing somehow, and align those different layers. But yeah, what mine looks like is this. That's, um, um, yeah, the technical aspect wasn't really that difficult to figure out. I, I got around that pretty quickly. But designing really good puzzles and finding the right art of aligning everything, that's actually really hard and not really that fun at that point. And so I dropped it, didn't pick it up again. At that point, it had been a really long, really tough year, I'm sure. A lot of you can relate to how terrible 2021 was in a lot of ways. And 
I mean, setting this insane challenge was probably part of why it was so hard, but it was also part of what got me through. And what demonstrated to me what I really enjoyed, uh, and in the end led me to quitting my job as a lecturer uh, and returning to the games industry. So yeah, if there's anyone here in the room who's considering maybe making 12 and 12, anyone up for the challenge? Ooh, I see a couple of hands. Cool. You don't have to commit. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna take down names. All right. So, um, but for those of you, I hope I still have a few minutes left. Cool. Um, then uh, I'm just gonna give you the three crucial steps that we have developed as part of this process. Step one: intention. Create a clear intention for your prototype at the beginning of each month. A good intention eliminates creative blocks and allows you to set a goal by which to measure all of your creative decisions by. You want to choose wisely, choose only one thing and something small. Something that you haven't done before, something that excites you. It doesn't have to be original, you get to clone something. You can look at a game and find a mechanic or find a kind of an art style or something that you know, inspires you and try to clone that. You will make something different. Cloning is not a thing anymore. People need to stop stressing about it. We all make amazing stuff. And all our brains go into a completely different way, so clone away. It will become something special on its own. Um, step two, production. Spend the month working on your prototype. And to do this well and not to burn out, you really have to understand how much time you have uh, and adjust the scope. You have to be realistic and set yourself goals uh, that you can actually achieve without burning out. <laughs> all right. Now we have to wrap up quickly. Um, so yeah, capture your progress. Uh, you want to watch yourself uh, improving. And uh, you need to also reflect in the end. So look at what you made, look at what you thought you were going to make, and um, compare the intention to your actual end result. And for this, it's really great to have a group of people to compare this with. Um, and yeah, I wanted to give a shout out to the people in my team, uh, the people who helped me get through this. That's Sugar. Adonai uh, and Ben, and Alex, who isn't here and doesn't really have a good social media presence, so I didn't. Uh, but yeah, they all made 12 and 12s. If you want to check that out, check this out, their Twitter handles. Uh, you might want to look at them. And that's it. So if you want to play my games, you can check them out on riker.itch.io. You can contact me on the interwebs, on TikTok, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, and all kinds of places as at realriker. And if you have any questions, please hit me up later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, so much, Henrike. That was really great. I can also only recommend doing a challenge like this. We did like a one game per week for like a semester in our university, which were like way smaller than like what you were doing. But it's such a learning experience. At no other point in my studies I learned more than while doing something like that. Thank you.